Today, I'm talking to Bradley Mason. Hi, Brad. How are you? Hi, Vic. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm all right. Still in. We still were... there, still there, still going. Yes, exactly. Uh, we were sort of comparing man caves at the beginning. Um, yeah, I think every man needs a man cave. I think it's really it good. It certainly does. And I was saying yours is very orderly. Well, yeah, I've tidied it up a bit, you know, because normally it's like piles of paper all over the desk. So, um, right. yeah. You I, can't see all the piles of paper, it's sort of down there. Yeah, I, mean, it's all, I, I don't know. I quite, when I look at someone's webcam and I see piles of paper, it kind of makes me think they're a, a deep thinker. Either that or they're very <laughs> disorganized. <laughs> or probably both, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, so, Brad, the traditional first question is what do you do? Oh, what do I do now? Okay, at this very moment in my life, I'm doing uh, branding and web development, kind of bespoke web, de web development for um, lots of councils and, and that kind of thing. Uh, over the years, I've done lots of different things, including music for about 20 years uh, as, as a living. Um, yeah, so it's been a, a really interesting journey. Shall I tell you my journey? Yes, do that. Okay, potted history. Um, I studied uh, graphic design at college, got bored with graphic design and then changed to a media course and studied film. And I ended up going to the Royal College of Art and studying film and then went into uh, uh, London and did uh, sound mixing for TV shows. Uh, so dubbing mixing is the title for that. And at the same time, I met a uh, singer songwriter and I started playing drums um, with a guy called Noel Richards. And f uh, at the same time as doing dubbing mixing in London uh, during the week, uh, at weekends, I would go off and do lots of gigs. And uh, that was about how many years ago? About 30 years ago. And then um, we moved down to Dorset about 15 years ago. And I've been doing the graphics um, and uh, branding a web for the last 15 years. Yes, yeah, so that's a kind of quick history of my my career so far. So what's interesting, what interests me, because obviously the whole thing about this podcast is about people who are creative and the sort of the diverse things that people do and how they sort of find their way into those things. Because I think it's actually quite, it's quite instructive to other people who are creative. You know, obviously a lot of people are starting out to realise that there isn't sort of like a career path. <laughs> <laughs> no no there's, there's not a career path but there's certainly dreams that you kind of have in your life from a very early age yes and i started playing drums when i was 11 yeah no yeah i played keyboards when i was seven you know learning all the scales with um classical music and reading all the dots and then when i went to secondary school um i fell in love with drums and i started learning drums and at that point, I kind of have a, I had a dream for drumming and it kind of it just ignited something in me. And um, I think when I had that opportunity when I was 18 and I met Noel, um, that dream kind of came alive. And, and then for 20 years, that was kind of like uh, that was my income and that was my job. But I would say it was birthed in a place of, um, of having that dream years and years ago. And I was... Um, how old was I when I was sitting in the garden? I must have been about eight years old, eight or nine years old. And I had all the garden, I had all the kitchen furniture, all the chairs and the stalls in the garden. And I'd made myself a drum kit. Mm. And I was tapping away on a, on a kind of dream drum kit. In my head, I was in a stadium. And that, I think that there was something there birthed. And my my parents could see that. My parents could see that I loved drumming. And I had no drum kit and I had no drum sticks. Um, and, but they invested into that and they bought me a drum kit and they bought me lessons. Um, so that, yeah. So although, yeah, although life is kind of like it meanders and you can go from career to career, 
I think in your heart, you have dreams at an early age and you, you kind of kind of just want to pursue them um, and just see where it goes. I was yeah, very that's lucky. brilliantly put. That's I was brilliant. very, I was very lucky because that dream when I was seven years old or eight years, years old in the garden with the with the kitchen furniture, that dream of being in a stadium, I, I saw that, you know, I've played various stadiums around the world um, later on in my life. So that, that that dream kind of did come to uh, come to pass. It's amazing. Yeah, that's brilliantly put. It's interesting that because that is exactly what I believe in, that you have to have that sort of vision that, that yeah. propels you into something because there is something in that visionary state that draws opportunities to you because you probably make different decisions, you know, in your life. You meet different people because you're, you've got this going. And often, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I do with people who come to have lessons with me is I will I will say to them, why, why do you want to play the guitar? You know, and on the face of it, they don't really know what I'm asking them. Because what I'm trying to get them to is that point where they'll turn around and say something like, well, I want to be in a band, I want to tour, I want to do this. You know, it's not just like, well, I want to be in a band, because you could do that and go down a pub. You know what I mean? But it's that sort of thing where they start to express this dream that's sort of beyond what's believable. You know, it's aspirational. Because I think that's what it sort of, as you say, it sparks something in you. It births an idea, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, we used to do um, we used to do youth work in our local church, and we used to, I used to, always used to ask the teenagers. I would say, so if you didn't have to earn a living and you hadn't got to earn money, what would you do with your life? Yeah, and you get some interesting answers from teenagers, but you can ask that same question to adults. And you say to an adult, if all your bills are paid for, all the food, all your cars, you've got enough money. What would you do with your life? And that suddenly ignites something in the adult because it, it makes them think, so what is my passion? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's like most people never think like that. Most people think, so, you know, I need to get a job to earn money to do this and do that. But exactly. actually, the pa if you start with the passion, I think you have a more ful fulfilled life. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And, and, I... with mu and with music, it's the same. You've got to find where your passion is and follow yeah. that and follow that path. I yeah. remember at the age of... It's a similar age, eight or nine, doing piano lessons. And I wanted to do, I said to my piano teacher, oh, I, you know, the classical stuff, you know, I'm not so keen on it. I want, I want to play movie themes, you know, all the, all the classic movie themes on the piano. That's what I wanted to do. And she said, well, OK, we'll do some movie themes. And then because I stopped practicing the classical pieces, she punished me by saying, oh, we're going back to the classical now. And that's all the wrong way around. It's like yeah. we should we should be seeing where the passion is in someone, yeah. and investing into people, and it, and you just got to enjoy it. Not everyone exactly. wants to play classical piano, um, you know. So if if I meet a young musician, I, I would say, you know, where is your passion? What do you love playing? Let's invest into that, as opposed to you've got to learn all the dots, got to learn all the notes. It's um, yeah, and I yeah. think that's something that when you've played music for long enough, you really see that clearly. Yeah. Even to, you know, like, you know, my my playing is and my teaching has changed over the years, and now I've got to this point of like, although potentially people could do pretty much anything, potentially, you know, if they spent the time. If you actually said to people and found out what it is that you you naturally can do, and you're naturally inspired by. You could arrive at, at a style of playing that is yours, that is unique, really fast, much mm. faster than if you just do this. You know, obviously, we need the scales and the chords and all the rest of it because it's a map, just in the same way as you have to understand time and less than as a drum, right? But once you've got the map, if you can then invest in what it is that excites you musically and that you find you're easily drawn to. I think we'd have 
we'd have some really amazing stuff happening. Because I think things have got a little bit dull somehow recently. Do you, who's to blame for that? Is that is that the kind of model that we have in teaching? Is yes. That, is that the issue? Yes, or, or... but I think it's actually slightly deeper than that. Because I think what happens is we always default to the point of how did they do that? We want to always make a logical construct uh, over something that actually probably isn't that explainable. We do it for a lot of things. And the arts, we do it all the time. So in other words, you get, you know, so-and-so is a great artist because he could do this, which is sort of slightly sort of nonsense really yeah um because somebody's a great artist because they see the world in a different way or they express themselves in a different way to other people and that's actually not really that easy to explain because it sort of sits underneath all of that and i think that's what happens with music and i always use hendrix as an example to this but he's not the only example obviously but if you think of what people thought was what made a great guitar player back in the early 60s, they would have they would have pointed their fingers at, you know, jazz guitar players, you know, the Tao Farlows and the Barney Kessels and the rest of it. Or they would have pointed their fingers at classical players or, or flamenco players, right? Mm. But then suddenly somebody comes along, and it's not just Hendrix, because it's also people like Eric Clapton, Page, Beck, and all the rest of it. In, in the sort of Western sort of sphere of that. There are lots of other players, you know, as well. But they certainly weren't doing what you would have said, you need to do this in order to become great, you know. And those sort of anomalies show us that actually we sort of slightly delude ourselves. So it's a sort of way of us trying to map out why things work. Because now that is so entrenched in an education system. Yeah. And you get this sort of rather bizarre thing that contemporary instrument like the guitar is taught sort of like a classical instrument, you know, where you will learn, you know, the solo by so-and-so for such and such. When these people were often making it up on the hoof, they had no bloody idea. You know, a lot of them had no idea what scale they were playing. They just knew what, what sort of worked? See, I, I, I kind of feel the most interesting players that I meet, get to play with, are those that kind of have got little imperfections and it's those little quirks that make them interesting. Exactly. And it's like, so it's if you listen to kind of session players in the States especially, yeah. and they've gone through college and they learn to play a yeah. certain way and they come out the other end all sounding the same, was actually the most interesting players aren't necessarily the tightest. No. There's some, there's some kind of, thing in their character that comes out when they play it is so actually it comes down to kind of a good teacher will see that and kind of work with that and kind of encourage that and it's actually those imperfections aren't a problem and it's the no. imperfection it's the imperfections no. that make life interesting anyway and in yeah. music it's like you know I, I can tell you a really good I, I can tell you something from my own life which expresses that really well obviously when i started off you just had to work things out off records because the books were rubbish. They were wrong. And it's before the tab stuff started to arrive. And I worked out a song by Roy, Roy Buchanan called uh, Tribute to Elmore James. And it was an instrumental, you know, four or five minutes instrumental. And I worked out virtually the whole thing apart from about four bars. And it drove me out of the wall because I couldn't work out what the heck this guy was up to. But a little while after, I started to realise that because you had to cheat. I think it's something like this, you know, and you, you'd come out with a thing. But I realised that that was truly me. Yeah. Everything else was a pastiche. Yeah. All right. And so I'm quite interested now in this this sort of thing of like nearly getting it right. You know, and there was that sort of thing in jazz of, of chord sequences where mm. you could take things and they're not quite right. You know, 
they're substituting chords that sort of yeah they're sort of right but there's a little bit of an imperfection in the harmony and it's that that makes it sort of work yeah because you can i mean uh, with chords chords are weird because you can ask you can ask 10 different people what chord sequence that is and they'll all hear it in a slightly different way yes. especially if the chord is complicated yes and, and they're, they're hearing seconds and fourths and ninths and thirteenths. Yes. They're, they're hearing all kinds of, of things and sometimes those are almost in your head yes it's really well, fact, bizarre it is in your head yeah I, point, yeah, yeah. but then Almost, so I could write down a chord sequence for something one day, and next day I could come back and play those same chords that I've written down, and they don't sound right to me. No, isn't it weird? Oh, it's I just like in it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, now what I tend to do is I, t I tend to think, well, because I, you know, I've spoken about this before on the podcast, but I tend to have a, a sort of perception about music that it, a song is something of its own, and it arrives. You just be you're part of the process. And it arrives through you, but it's not yours, right? And I found that has been incredibly liberating. Because then if a song arrives and it's got a particular shape to it that you can sort of go, nah, you know, no, that's how it is. That's yeah. how that song is. And and then what, what I found is that when you approach music that way, and I teach it that way as well now, that it's got it's got more. It's got more, um, it's more organic. It's got some sort of agency to the thing. It, it starts to dictate to you what is ne necessary next, right? Yeah. Instead of you think, oh, yes, have the, you know, the such and such a guitar solo in the middle. No, you don't just do that. You, you know, what's the song telling you? It's coming, you know? Um, and I find that much easier to work with. Which again, if you did that in a college, it, 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 you can't really put that on a lesson plan. Yeah. You know what I mean? So going back to getting to what you're saying, what, what's the problem? Is I think underlying is we try to explain why. And now we've made that into a structure. Yeah. That, that has got money behind it because, you know, people are paying to go to a college and, you know, you need to get the results and blah, 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 blah. Etc. And it and it unfortunately makes that become sort of slightly lifeless. Yeah. And it's interesting you you're saying about the thing about the American session guys, because we did a rehearsal last almost a week ago. Yeah. Which was such great fun, um, and we haven't played together for a long time. No. Certainly, you haven't song. We haven't written songs together for a long time. Um. And on the way there, I, I I stopped off and I taught somebody who I normally teach online who lives in Winchester. So, you know, it's a fair, it's about nearly two hours. And then from there, it's quite, it was quite close to Southampton. But of course, to miss the traffic, I left early. And I stopped off at a fleet services right, to have Lovely. some breakfast. Lovely. Yes. <laughs> but actually, I say, the breakfast there was really good. I was impressed and it wasn't that expensive. So I was, yeah, because normally it's a bit like, ah. but there we go. But I dipped into the loo and they were playing, there was some music playing and it was some, I don't know, 1980s, sort of late 80s American song. I, I, don't, I can't quite place it, but it, it was that standard type of thing if you had, Christopher Cross or anybody like that. It was those type of players, great yeah. players, you know, probably, probably most of Toto. Yeah. Yeah. But the song sounded rubbish. I don't mean it wasn't musically very good because it was. Soulless. Yeah. Is that the word? Yes. Yeah. Utterly soulless. Yeah. Great chords and all that, all very clever stuff, but totally boring. Yeah, and, and I just thought, and it's funny you should say that because I was on on the way to meet you. Well, I, I've played in lots of covers bands, and actually, it, some covers bands that you got to play the notes exactly as yeah. a recording, and that's what they want. And it's like, and that is that, that I'm not interested in that because yeah. it's like, well, that's someone else's interpretation of that song. 
Um, and I, I much prefer bands where you're kind of having fun with the music and everyone's Absolutely. kind of playing. And it's, it might not be exact, but actually there's more life in it because people are kind yeah. of playing what's coming from them as opposed to what they're copying. Exactly. And what's so ridiculous and pretty ludicrous about that is a lot of those great bands won't just replicate live what they put. No. What they've done in the studio. But well, they probably so couldn't. What the hell are people doing that? <laughs> Particularly when you could just sit at home in the comfort comfort of your own home and just listen to the music at home. Why would you go and see a band play that unless they're going to do something really interesting? Yeah. I mean, either just look interesting. Um, so I think there's it's a mindset thing. Yeah. It's but just, it, but know, it, comes to, it, boxes. it comes down to passion and enjoyment, doesn't it? And it's like, I think, yeah. and that's what we need to encourage. Yes, yes, and I think I think that's really important um, because otherwise, why? You know, I, I think I think we share the same point. Here. Why would you play music if you were just doing it as a like a job, like you you know, like some sort of chippy? You know, it's coming in. It's like, oh yeah, I want to put that sideboard up. All right, okay, yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, I. I I mean, I, I think there is space for copying the greats. Yeah, but I'm not saying there isn't. But if yeah. that's all you do, yeah, that, I mean, that becomes. Did my son learn? He's never had a guitar lesson, and he learned. He's 21 now. He started playing guitar when he's about 11 or 12, and he's learned everything off YouTube. So he he hear a song, a John Mayer song. He loves that song, yeah. and yeah. he'll go on. And there's someone teaching him exactly yeah. how to play it. Yeah. And he, he, he's kind of learned by the copy technique. Yeah. And, it, you know, he's still creative. He can still do his own stuff. But actually, that's the way he learned. It's a note for note. Yeah. But the is... thing is that he can do his own stuff. Yeah. You know, when I was working things out of records, the idea was to try to get it as, as exact as you could. But the, 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 the <laughs> problem the problem is, yeah. is the, that the attitude that you need to regurgitate. I, um, I learned off a record once. It was... I was, I was in a covers band and we were doing, is it Madness? It Must Be Love? That yeah. song. And someone sent me a cassette that they recorded off a record. Right. And obviously when when they when they recorded it off the record, the needle must have jumped because it was like a, a, it's a really weird, odd type signature bar halfway through one of the sections because the needle jumped. And I learned, I learned that little, <laughs> the jump, and we played it live with the needle jump. Right. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, it's not brilliant, is it? But, no, but it, no, but I think it's only years really later that I, it, it was years later that I heard kind of oh well that jump isn't there. And that was just what was on the recording that I played. That's amazing. Isn't that weird. That is the, whole, weird. The, the whole band learned it off the same cassette with the with the problem in it, and nobody picked up on that. Well, it doesn't matter, does it? We played it with confidence. It's just no, got, exactly, well, exactly. It's just got well, it's, just got, it's, thing, got, it's it? just got a thirteen sixteen bar in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah. So that's an interesting point because playing with confidence is one of the key elements of being able to do anything that's slightly out there, isn't it? Yeah. Whether that's sort of playing, playing sort of outside in jazz. You know, if you're playing, if you're playing all the notes and you're a semitone out, because that's, that's what you're going to do. If you play it like you're not sure what you're doing, it just sounds utterly wrong. Yeah, and especially for a drummer. It's almost like yes. if you don't know what you're doing, you should, it should still feel like the drums are in control. Yes. And, that, and that's a confidence thing. It's like playing, you know, pick pick your groove, stick to it and play it with confidence. Yes. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, yeah. It, it, otherwise it feels like you're making an apology for your groove. Yes. And, and, that's and, that's, and, that's and a can, really... And you can sense that when people play. Yeah, if it's can, like, not really sure what they're doing. So kind of, you know, even wrong or right, just play it with confidence. Yeah. Well, that's the same with, with unusual time signatures. You know, mm. if I, if I'm teaching kids to to play in unusual time signatures and and also to explore what you can do with time. That is the thing that I say to them. If you hear something and it sounds like it's clever, it's wrong. <laughs> because really great songs in unusual time signatures shouldn't sound like they are. No. It's your groove, right? Yeah. And I think that's part of that thing of of it sounding real. 
sounding like it should be doing that, which is a confidence thing. Right? Yeah. Um, because again, a lot of these, I mean, Sting's a good example of that, isn't it? I mean, stuff that Sting does in unusual time signatures doesn't sound like it's, well, you'd know it that it was, but no, nobody normally would go like, oh, that's a bit strange. Yeah, and that's, that's to do with flow, though, isn't it? So everything just yeah, well, flows from bar to yeah. bar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and sort of groove. But if you're not playing it like you mean it, then it doesn't... Yeah. My my, my, my son always has this phrase. Um, what, he goes something like, oh, you felt like you're in control today, Dad. If you're playing drums, and it kind of feels like you're in control. And I think as a drummer, it needs to feel like you are controlling a little bit. You know, yeah, you're kind of steering things, and well, yeah, absolutely. And I think and that's the, you know you are the most important person in a band, oh, and that's coming you. from a guitar player, right? <laughs> Which is you know it pains me to say, <laughs> but no, it's it's true. I mean, without without the drums controlling things, nothing's going to work. You know, yeah. So let's go back to the the stuff that you did with Noel because that was amazing. Because when I met you, you were you were you and Andy were playing for Noel. Um, and uh, you were playing in enormous places, weren't you? How did yeah, that so I met, develop? Yeah, so I met Andy. Uh, so Andy and I both started working with Noel about the same time. So both about 18, 19 years old. And Noel was kind of, he was up and coming in the kind of Christian music scene. Yeah. And um, the Christian music scene at that point, you know, most churches didn't have bands, you know, most churches, it was like an organ or maybe a guitarist. And Noel came along at a time when churches were kind of crying out for kind of a development of, of Christian music. Yeah. So we were going round and we got invited to, to start with lots and lots of churches and then lots of kind of Christian events. And that kind of grew and grew and we kind of got bigger and bigger platforms. And, you know, eventually we were, we were kind of doing stadiums around the world. Yeah. You know, Christians in different countries would invite Noel and other Christian musicians out and we play in stadiums. And, you yeah. know, f a time in my life when, you know, just a young family, we were getting on a plane nearly every week, flying somewhere and going in and doing a, a two hour set or, or shorter sometimes going in, doing a gig and then flying out again. And it's, um, and I think, well, I was amazingly blessed. You know, you could say lucky or, you know, yeah. lucky, lucky to meet Noel. I kind of see it in a blessing in, in in that dream that I had in my garden when I was eight. Yeah, no, no, I get that. And it's, get that. it's, it was incredible. And Ollie, my son, Ollie keeps saying to me, right. So I'm, I'm 21. Um, when am I, when am I going to meet my Noel? Cause he kind of thought, he kind of thought it's automatic. You, you learn music and you automatically, yeah. you meet someone who just could, he takes you on a, an amazing journey. And that doesn't happen to everybody. In fact, it no. is, it's quite rare. So I was incredibly lucky, incredibly blessed for that to happen. Um, and I said, I said to Ollie, you know, it's not just about the music. It's not just about what you play. It's about your character. It's about it's about how you are with people. It's about, you know, d does someone want to sit on a plane with you for eight hours and, and chat? Exactly. And, and if they don't, you probably don't matter how well you play, you're not going to get the gig. So no, you're there's, not. There's, there's lots of things that have to come together. Yeah, for you to kind of be, uh, I'll say, attractive to other musicians. Yeah. You know, are you professional? Do you turn up on time? Do you keep good notes? Do you, do you play the gig well? Um, are you a pain in the ass during the sound check, or are you kind of, you know, helpful? Um, are, you know, do you get on with people? Um, so there's lots of things that come together, and with Noel, it just clicked. As people, we kind of got on really well. I've spent probably more time on a plane and an airport with Noel and the band than I have with my family. You know, yeah. it's like hours and hours and hours just together and, and being together and living life together. And the bit on stage is kind of a, a small part of life, but um, yeah. Yeah. Amazing opportunities. And, you know, played lots of stadiums and lots of arenas. Um, and, and to be honest, my favorite gigs are kind of like a 1000 seater they're always the kind of, they've got the best feel about them. Stadiums, in a way, become almost too big. You're yeah. too detached. Um, yeah. a, a kind of a big theatre, a, a really nice venue with about a thousand people. That just is amazing. Great feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Newcastle, Newcastle City Hall, which is uh, it's about 2,000 seater. 
something like that that's an incredible venue you, f you feel like part of the audience it's just the yeah. way the way it's laid out yeah it's good yeah that's that's really really good because you've just sort of nailed all of the things that i think are absolutely essential to succeed as an as an artist you know because if you we got this again this sort of <clears throat> view that people have what artists are like you know musicians are like, they're sort of diva-ish and all that sort of stuff and that's nonsense in most most th most things i mean unless you've really got to the top yeah people you know, people are playing for you um and that is a very very rare situation to be in generally you've just got to be really easy to get on with yeah. you've got to be a really good person as you say really organized and you've got to be able to do what it is that is required yeah um and you've got to bring it because you're bringing yourself to it that's the point yeah. again it's this back to this thing about but it's not really about it is about the music but it's not really about the music it's about you and what you bring as your personality to the thing yeah because again, when people look, um, watch a band, what are they seeing? They're not seeing music, are they? They're seeing people. Yes, right. I mean, I mean, look at the police. Yes. Those three characters, those three people, it's like it was, there was a kind of a love between them, but a tension between them. Yeah. And um, yeah, it wasn't just about the music, was it? No. Nope. There's the something about when those three guys walked on stage there was a kind of like an energy and that. Yes. Is, and it's like, and it's not just about the music. It's about the way they were together. And I would say that is true of every great band. Yeah. Every great band. There is something about them that ties them, groups them together in a way that fascinates. Yeah. So, you know, whether that's Led Zeppelin or whether that's Beatles, you know, the different, different, ways that that happens and again this is something that when we do this sort of blues camp thing um we go through that people when they're playing about what is it that an audience sees because again this is one of the things that a lot of people don't even think about because they always think it is about what they're doing in their little bit yeah. you know that sort of is like a bit of the jigsaw puzzle that just fits in but actually, it's not really that. It's much bigger than that, you know. So, yeah, that's that's a really, really fascinating point. So Just, how long did that stuff with Noel go on for then? Um, well, we still do. Um, last year, we played in the stadium in Hungary. Um, so Noel's no, still getting gigs. It got to a stage about 10, about 15 years ago. Uh, where well, it was just too busy. And I think as a band, we all had families. And we kind of said to Noel, we're, you know, we're just doing too many gigs. And it, it, we were at a point where we were flying to Germany. I remember we we're doing a lot of work in Germany. And it was like every Thursday night or every Thursday, we'd go on a plane and we'd do gigs in Germany, then come back. And that was, it was starting to get hard work with, with a family at home. So about 15 years ago, it kind of, naturally started to kind of tail off and uh noel who uh, he lives in uh, mallorca now and he's still doing um occasional work and uh we still get to play with him um but yeah that was a, it was it was a natural journey we went on a real big high you know at, at one point we're kind of all around the world and it kind of that that come that came to an end but i think it came to an end at a point where churches you know, as as I say, you know, thirty years ago, churches didn't have you know yeah. many musicians in church, and you know, almost inspired by people like Noel and and other musicians like him, churches started to build their bands and they started to invest in musicians. And now, you know, most churches you go to in the UK have yeah. have, have bands, you know, and and very you know good musicians, um, you know, good sound systems. You know, it's, it's all just the level of everything's gone up and up and up. It's so kind of the mm -hmm. need for someone like a Noel to go in and and kind of do concerts for churches has become less and less. Yeah, that's but interesting, when, you know, isn't it? 
but yeah, what 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 a privilege to be part of that journey. It's yeah, amazing. And yeah. and interestingly, something that probably can't be replicated again because the circumstances are different. Like I say, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and um, and I think that's that's often what we sort of miss when we look at really successful bands. That that is that happens. You know, the people, that's absolutely true with the Beatles. Yeah. Um, and that would be true with bands like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, you know, because obviously that was a different thing that was beginning to develop and then they were there, you know. And the police, you know, that sort of thing of taking taking all this sort of stuff, you know, the punk thing, and then making that, you know, happen, um, that sort of mix of reggae and all that sort of thing, you know, sort of like a multicultural aspect to the music. Um, but if, again, you're the, if you're the first to do something, yes, there's there's going to be a gap in the market because you're the first yes. to do it. So um, that's yeah. exactly it. But when that's you've it. got hundred people copying you, the gap in the market's gone. <laughs> yeah. So well, uh, yeah, because what what you've done is you've inspired people to take your take your work away from you. Yeah. I can say that quite confidently about guitar teaching in this area. There's lots of guitar teachers out there, and I've taught most of them. So it's a bit, it's a bit. Anyway, such is life, as they say. Yeah. So what, what's your feeling on kind of like when someone comes to you and says they want to make money out of music? <laughs> as opposed to, as, you know, because I'm the opposite. For, for me, I'm inspired by somebody who says, I just love music. I want to do more music. And I've got I passion get, for music. No. Do you people, get people that come to you and say they want to make money? And that's their No, that's they don't say it that way. They're, they're very English about it. They'll say, I'd like to teach guitar. But, you know, that type of thing, which is, I suppose, near, the nearest that you're going to get to, I want to make money out of this. Yeah. Um, you see, I think the secret of that is that you have to be an entrepreneur. I think those skills are closer to the skill of an entrepreneur. And that's why it can't, I say it can't be taught in college. But it can't be taught in college because of the fact it's like if somebody wants to be an entrepreneur, where do you go to learn? That? You can look at other people and go, oh, that's really interesting. You know, so and so did this, so and so did that, and be inspired to be able to see that type of thing. And music, being a successful musician is like that, whether you're being a successful teacher. Because it's, as we said before, there's no career path. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what makes that difficult with colleges. Because I think a lot of kids go in thinking that they're going to make money out of that. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would almost warn against it. I, I, I think yes. It's, it's, I think it's very hard to kind of make a good living in terms yes. of uh, the actual financial reward is not great for musicians. No, but, exactly. <laughs> which we uh, both know, but it's like the joy of it, I think, is more important. That is the point. Yeah. That is the point. Now, I'm not saying that people can't make market money out of it, but if you have the attitude you're going to make money out of it, yeah. that's probably the wrong way of looking at it. And I would say that's the same for art. And I would say, you know, being a painter, being a portrait painter or whatever, You've got to do it because you love it. And yeah. the thing is that as soon as you do it because you love it, that comes through what you're doing. And then you might find a way of expressing that in, a, in such a way that people will pay you for it. So there's a good example of this. A friend of mine is a very good artist, but it's not his job. But he does it because he enjoys it, and he says it's good for it's good for his well being. But he's done some pet portraits, and they are brilliant. They are so good. But of course, what he's doing is he's doing them for people whose pets have died. Yeah. So there is an extraordinary demand. Yeah. Um. And he's also doing it in such a way that people donate. So he could suggest roughly how much, but people could 
donate what they feel they want to pay. So instead of, and he's saying, well, you know, in a way that's not enough, but it's, it's enough in a way that people are contributing. But the feeling that he has is that he's not doing it to make money, which yeah. makes it far more enjoyable to do. So if you did a, uh, if you did a gig, I don't know what venue, I don't know, say a 200 seater venue, and you said to people, you just give what you like. You come along for free. Do you think that would work? Well, people used to do that, didn't they? They yeah. used to pass the hat around. I think the way to do it, and we certainly used to do this with Red Touch, actually, but we get a support band and we were playing a venue that we had to fill seats. I would get, you know, if we had two support acts, I certainly did this a lot with Bravura, actually. I certainly did it with Red Touch. Um, I would get the support bands to pay me for tickets. Yeah. But I would do it in such a way that it was the, the cost to me of that ticket. And then they could keep the profit. And if they couldn't see that they could make money out of that, then they weren't the people to have. Yeah. Because they wouldn't bring people anyway. So that was one thing I did. So... You could then say to people that there is a like a certain bursary for certain tickets. Because some people are all find it awkward donating, actually, because they don't know what to give. So you've got right. to have something that gives them an idea. Yeah. I mean restaurants have done it, haven't they? Where there's yeah. no prices and you just pay at the end of the meal what you think it's worth. Yes. Yes. There's a place down in Brighton called the Real Junk Food Cafe. Yeah. Which has become an extraordinary thing where they get, you know, they get food that's going to be thrown away. And it's it's only because it's the sell by date, right? Yeah. And it's not because the food's rubbish or whatever. And they're able to feed, pe you know, hundreds of people for very small donations they'll say they'll suggest a price yeah and it's like it used to be a couple of quid we got three course meal and the food's fabulous but now they're also i, I saw i saw the guy who runs this being on a jamie, um, jamie oliver pro about feeding school children during yeah. the holidays um but it, we need we need to think much more about that. And I'm not saying we couldn't do that. We just say, look, that's available. The only thing is, if you knew that you could cover your costs, yeah, pay the musicians and all the rest of it, because obviously a lot of people do need to be paid. But if you knew that you could do that easily, you could, you could do that. Yeah. It's a risk, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, it but it's like, like you're saying about playing confidently, isn't it? Yeah, just go out and do it. I mean, You've got it, to go out and do it, yeah. And I mean, there's, I mean there's, money... there are lots of other ways of funding it, aren't there? Yeah. Because if you say to people, look, you know, if you went to businesses and said, look, we need some sponsorship, this is what we're doing. Could you sponsor us in such a way that you could even feed that money back to the people who sponsor you if you make a profit? You know what? There's lots of things you yeah. could do. I mean, money does taint everything, doesn't it? And it's it like, does. And it's like and it suddenly changes from when you from when you start a hobby, whether yes. it be painting or or playing music. When it becomes your job, it changes. Yeah. And it, and it's like suddenly you've got to think about how much you're asking for and how much you're going to get, and and that's hard. Yes, it is. Because it started off as a passion, and it started off as a I want yeah. to create something. Yeah. Now, I think the difference is, see, this is when you're dealing with people, you can, these things are great to do, you know, with all the donations and, you know, allowing people to pay what they can afford and all the rest of it. Sort of democratizing stuff, right? Or making it accessible. But when you're dealing with companies already locked into pricing, like you're doing, you're talking about, you know, website. 
design yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. That's much easier to work on a financial model. Yeah. It, much it, easier. I still, though, appreciate... So if I do, if I create something, a brand or a website, it's the email I get back from someone says, I love what you've done. It's yeah. perfect. That email... It's worth it means, it's, it's yeah. worth more to me than them paying the invoice. It in one sense. Yeah, no, I get, like, I absolutely get that. And it's like because that's just the way I'm built. You know, you have those yeah, love but, languages, don't you? And I think for me, it's like words of encouragement and words yes. are important. Yeah, words are what make our world, right? Yeah. And um, and being a musician, you're putting yourself out there, and you're being vulnerable, and you're yes. sharing something of yourself. Yes. And afterwards, actually, it's not the check you desire. It's a couple of people to say, love what you did tonight or love yes. what you played. I tell you, for me, it's when I, I get somebody come up to me and say, you taught me 30, 40 years ago and I still play the guitar. That's or good. I, you know, or I, a little while ago, I went to have a guitar repaired and I've, I've known of this guy but I've just never been there so I went there because this needed some you know it was one of my better guitars that needed proper in fact it was the blue yeah, yeah. ESP that I brought the other day and I walked in I saw this guy still didn't tweak and it wasn't until he said, oh, can I have your name and telephone number? And I said my name. This guy turned around. I went, <laughs> he said, Vic, oh, my God. He said, you taught me 40-odd 40, 40 years ago. And when he said that, suddenly I recognised him. Wow. And so this is a guy who's he's made a – a living out of music, out of playing, repairing guitars and having a music shop and playing and all the rest of it. And I thought, that's great. To me, that makes me feel that what I've done is real value for people. Yeah, there's a, there's a horrible statistic which goes something like, I think 90% of the encouragement you get in life happens before you're 10 years old. 90%. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's like, and it's like <laughs> I don't. Uh, maybe it's just me, but I kind of feel as I go through life. Actually, no, I need encouragement, and I think we all do. And I think we can all be part of encouraging others. And so, when you see a musician play in a pub, and you can tell they're trying, you know, they're, they're giving it their all. It might not be perfect. Take the opportunity after that gig just to go up and say, "Well done," because yes. those that those little steps of encouragement. Are the kind of things that that carry you know, give people the momentum to carry on. Yes, and, and if, if if you keep doing things in life, you get no encouragement. Basically, that becomes discouragement. Yes, that's like I, I, you know, when when someone says to me they don't feel encouraged, I say, well, that's just the way the world is sometimes. But be you know, start with you, <laughs> start exactly. encouraging other people. Exactly, and, and, and I think you know, for any kind of music teacher, that's the most important thing is to encourage, encourage, encourage. I've I've been reading an interesting book about how the Greeks saw how um, drama could improve their psych um, psychological well being. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know, Aristotle wrote about it, and so did Plato actually. And that idea that things. Your psychological well-being is so important. And encouragement is one of those, because if you think of that word, it means to enliven the heart, right? You know, to bring means. you courage. Okay, enliven the heart. Yeah, well, I think there's a link, isn't there, with courage and heart? Can't remember what the actual... Um, is it... I think it's... Is it Latin... I don't know. Anyway, I, I was too busy playing drums when I was at school, not not studying Latin. No, no, I, I never learned it that way. So, <laughs> so. But the point about it, it is about this thing about built, you know, giving 
to encourage somebody yeah. is to give them bravery, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the point about this is that we've always known that it's important for people's well-being to be given encouragement, you know, and certainly the Greeks would have believed, would have known that. Um, we don't do much of that. No. And, and the only way that you can make that type of thing happen, as you say, is, is to do it to other people. Yeah. And as soon as you start that process off, it starts to come back. Yeah. It's it like, does. you know, it's like sowing the seed, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that's so important. So the link here is that here's something that people used to do and in certain cultures. It, it's, it's a given, but we don't do this very much either, which is if you went to somebody's house, they'd offer you food. They'd offer you, you know, people don't even offer you a cup of tea anymore. Is right? that not? Is that just you, Vic, or is that everybody? No, no, this is something that I've noticed. So you could go to somebody's house and teach them and they won't even offer you a drink. Which is actually outrageous. Yeah. Really. Because going again, going back to our Greek thing, the Greeks had this thing that you didn't know who that person was, the stranger. Yeah. He could be Zeus. And the the the, the, the Norse were the same. It could be Odin. You didn't know. So you should offer the stranger food, right? And as there's a thing in Christianity, is there not where you know you don't know whether it could be Christ turning up in the in the form of somebody you don't know. So you yeah. should offer them food. And it's that sort of thing of like we've sort of in in this culture, because in other cultures they do this, but we're really bad at it. And it's yeah. this sort of stripping back of things all the time, you know, not not offering, you know, gratitude to people. Thank you for playing. That was really good. I yeah. enjoyed that, you know. I think it makes the world a much better yeah. place. And I think for a creative person, you know, because when you create something, whether it's a painting or whether it's a live performance, you're giving of yourself and, and you feel vulnerable and you almost need someone just to assure you after yeah. you've done that, yeah. that, that was good or well done. And yeah, you and but when you come away from something and you've heard nothing, there's yeah. this kind of void, this emptiness, and your mind kind of fills it with all negative thoughts. Yes, um, yes, because it's for people. It's easier to criticise than it is to compliment. If you think about it, yeah. You know, well, I, I don't know, but a gig you wouldn't go and criticise, would you? No, but what I'm saying is that from from a distance, that's what people do. Yeah, they'll find fault. Yeah, because that's easy. It's easy yeah, to find fault but, in something. But face-to-face, -face they don't. So you already yeah. know that that is not the natural state that people have. Yeah. But from a distance, obviously social media is the classic one now, right? It's easy to comment and criticise. Yeah. And to say, and instead of saying, well, you know, they did quite well, really. Right. But if I was a if I was a, a top artist with a media presence, you know, Facebook page, whatever, I don't think I'd ever look at it because it's just no. brutal. It's absolutely it brutal. And you might you might read a hundred positive comments, but it's the one negative one, which just sticks in your mind, isn't it? It's it's horrible. Yeah, I, just I on know. that point, that's really interesting. My one of my nephews works for a um, a council in the West Country, quite high up, dealing with roads and all that and you can imagine what that's like right getting sort of planning through and yeah and they get um emails through to them which are so bad they could prosecute people so for, these are people complaining about the roads yeah or complaining yeah, about complaining service. about just yeah. things right but they're not just saying look this is terrible you know, what's going to happen about it. It's like almost singling out people. They find out who works in the council. Must be. And he said, we actually took action with some of these people. And 
when the police go round and I go round with the police, you suddenly find these people are just ordinary people who are suddenly appalled and shocked by what they've done. Well, when they read it back? Yes, when they're maybe. confronted with what they've done. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I, I mean, I think some people are just a bit bitter and it's like if something goes wrong in life, they want to blame somebody. Yeah, of course they do. But they wouldn't do it face to face. That's what we. <laughs> yeah. You know. So I mean, that, yeah. I mean, that's that's the opposite of encouragement, isn't it? Yes. It's like going out of your way to kind of cause problems. It's, yes. Uh, we should yeah, go out as of if it makes encourage if it as if it makes you special, like being the person who you know on the radio too phony. <laughs> that type of character, you know, yeah. they they've got all the answers, but in actual fact. Because they're phoning in, they a, obviously haven't got any answers because they've got time to. Just talking about stupid. just talking about character. There's a, there's a thing that I've, I've I've noticed that when some people walk into a room, the room lights up, and other people, it's kind of like it feels heavier. Yes, and I've always you want to strive to be the kind of person when you walk into the room, you yes. kind of like you're bringing a lightness and a happiness and a kind of joy into the. Place. Yeah, they light the room up. Absolutely, yeah. and that I don't, you know. That's deciding to be that person, though, isn't it? It's deciding it when you go in, you get yeah, positive. See the best in people, see the best in a situation. And that's why when the three of us got in that room the other day, we all had to put on our dark glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. We, we've not been in a room together for, I don't know, eight years? No, no, six years probably, is it? Well, six years, okay. but we, we were only running through songs that we'd already done. Yeah, that's right. So last, last we week, haven't been we, in a we, room we, we, together where we've actually been creating. Yeah, it was great. It was fantastic. And it's, I think we finished, didn't we finish by, and this is a great way to write a song. You just said to me, just play anything. You know, yes. as, as a drummer, normally you follow someone else's lead. You, you're following a sequence to a song or a groove to a song. But to start a song with, you know, or to start the writing process with just play anything, Brad, play anything. So I didn't really think about it. I just played something. It was kind of yeah. the stonesy kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Kind of. And uh, then out of that, Andy started playing something and you started playing yeah. something. Before you know it, you've got a groove and yeah. the structure comes next. Yeah. It was a great way to write. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I've, uh, you know, I, I've obviously, because I teach, well, teach writing. I've written a, a book about using sort of things like cut up all the trickery that, people use to to create and 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 you know open doorways basically and because i'm doing this virtually every day now and i have been using this process right the way back well before i ever met you but i've got to the point where and i suppose it, it, it's a level of bravery i guess yeah realizing that my ideas are, are not as good as the ones that are in the room. Yeah. And to do that, sometimes I have to break habits, which means I need to be put on the back foot. And by throwing something out there, I don't know what that's going to be. I have to respond to the thing that comes back. And it, and I did a similar thing with, with Andy, um, where the song that I'd, I'd written was about somebody who was a bass player, who was a, in a way, he was my Noel Richards yeah. on a very small way because he changed the way I thought about songwriting. And he was a really great bass player, but it's in a sort of reggae sort of, sort of groove, right? Yeah. Sort of reggae, sort of rock type groove. But he would always play these real, really lyrical lines. So, as it was a song about him, the first, the to me, it was obvious to say to Andy, "Could you play me?" And obviously, he was like, he's never, never, never been asked to play a melody type of thing. Yeah. But he played something that was really great, and then instantly, I it was there, and it was totally where I needed that to be for the song to do what it was going to do. Um. Yeah, it, it, that that putting musicians on the spot is interesting, though, isn't it? Because in a live situation, that just happens, doesn't it? Yes. 
So you suddenly end up in a, piece, a bit of a song which you've never been to before and everyone just kind of finds their way and something exactly. quite, oh, quite often it's just interesting. It's yes. interesting and it can be amazing. Yes. Actually, in a songwriting situation, that's what you want to encourage and you want to nurture that kind of like just try anything. Yes. You know, absolutely. What's that, what's that saying? If you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. Yes, exactly. And I, and I think that in it, for any musician in a rehearsal setting or a place where there's no audience, just make a mess of it. Just push things to the, to the to the limit. Yeah, mm -hmm. I also like the one fail forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, so every time something goes wrong, it, it pushes you into another place that you hadn't gone because you're not you're not doing something habitually. Yeah. You know, you're doing something different. And again, that's another reason why we were talking about the, the way that things are being taught now. That's not allowing that to happen. You have to do, you have to do something else to make that happen. You know, um, otherwise you're not coming up with anything different, are you? Yeah. You know, you're not going to come up with different situations. So, I haven't spoken any more about you mentioned about sound for film, yeah, or TV, and, and that was yeah, yeah. that was really interesting. And you haven't said anything about it. Could you just talk a little bit about it? Is so, that... so a dubbing mixer. So when they when you make a TV program, it's kind of edited or it's shot, then edited, and the very last thing that the very last job that's done is the sound mix. So I kind of uh, I, at college I studied sound design and, and dubbing mixing and I then because I was living in London uh, uh kind of in the west end in the Soho square mile most of the tv work post-production work takes place so I kind of fell into that a little bit by accident I went into a studio and said can I use your studio at night can I because it's not being used at night can I use it from midnight to eight in the morning on a student film so I would turn up at midnight and I'd learn all their kit and I'd learned to use all their um, studios through the night for free. And then the studio said, oh, can you do a session for us? Um, and I said, yeah, sure. And the session was, I think it was adding, no, it was mixing PGA golf, PGA golf tournament. And it was, it was a two hour show and I just had to mix. You know, it's about four faders. And a bit like music, I just got on with the studio. And I, you know, your character is important in all in all walks of life. I got on with that studio and then found another studio, did the same thing. And before long, I had a kind of a career in kind of um, in freelancing as a dubbing mixer. Um, so, you know, done shows like Panorama and Top Gear and uh, Trigger Happy TV. Do you remember that with Don yeah, Jolly? Yeah. You, you know, that diddle -do 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 -do. I was the guy that stuck that on. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I did lots of lots of shows. And you, you realise it's a lot about... Um, not panicking because you know on a, on a show like Top Gear you've got to mix yes. that in a day. Yeah, you've got one day to do a, a broadcast mix of, of a one hour show, so you've you've got to be fast, you've got to be efficient, and you've got to get on with you know a room full of directors. Or I mean, I mean the worst is advertising. So if you're doing an advert, you end up with like creative directors and coming into the room, and you might have six or seven of them sitting behind you, and you're mixing away, and uh, they're all they want to you know. Yeah, give their opinions on things, and and it's a bit handling handling a very interesting situation with lots of creatives trying to prove their worth. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. So, alongside the drumming, for about twenty years, I was doing sound mixing and drumming, um, which it was a perfect mix, and it, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds so fascinating. But but now but now at home, I've got I've got Pro Tools um, Pro Tools set up and. And lots of um, mics and stuff like that. So we record up here in my man cave. Um, yeah. So that's a, that, we were saying. You know the benefits of a COVID lockdown. Yeah. Well, so COVID. Uh, my kids were what seventeen and nineteen. So at a stage where they're just about to leave home, just about to go off and do universities, and and Ollie wanted to travel. COVID came along. So for a whole year we were locked down as a family. They 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 couldn't go anywhere. Um, but for that, for me and Ollie, that was fantastic. We used to make loads of music. Um, yeah, absolutely loved that 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 year. And I, and I know not everyone loved, loved lockdown, but for us, for for us, the timing was perfect. And we did loads of Pro Tools work and wrote songs and just tried different things. It's fantastic, great. Yeah, that's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. So I've got I've got this love for sound 
and and sound mixing and also a love for music and yeah, yeah. And, and and the kind of web work is just a way in one sense to to pay the bills yeah is it well it's you know it's a mix of things isn't it like yeah a lot of people are sort of saying now you know it's obvious that the days of having a job for life is that's definitely gone but it's now a case of having jobs where you're doing lots of things that sort of fit in and yeah I mean, and that's not easy because, no. you know, you're, you're competing with lots of other people doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, but you you know, everyone's built differently. I met, I met a woman at the weekend and she was, she's mid twenties and she's working for the council as an accountant. And, uh, and, she, and I said, oh, are you going to stay working for the council? Uh, you know, or are you going to you know, do your own thing, become a chartered accountant and then start your own company? And her reply, she, bearing in mind she's mid twenties, she said, "Oh no, the pension's really good at the council. I think I think I might stay with them." And it's almost like her her outlook on life was actually security and yeah. A lot of people think job. like that, and that's that is an American thing. But yeah. they think about benefits. I mean, that, everyone's different, aren't they? But for yeah. me, I, I'm I, I would feel very claustrophobic thinking I was on a job in my mid twenties, which is going to last my whole life. Yeah, especially being an accountant when there's AI looking around in the thing i think that's yeah be... yeah yeah there are some jobs that just will be done better by AI. yeah 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 but don't panic about that and you know you just got to live life haven't you of course you have In absolutely it. brilliant yeah all right then Brad. well thank you that cheers Vic. fascinating as i to chat it was lovely to talk to you yeah um we'll catch up soon yeah don't disappear won't disappear and um, yeah thanks ever so much cheers see you soon mate Bye. Mm -hmm.